Good afternoon, everybody. Today's hearing probes the question of whether or not there is an African resource curse. The resource curse refers to the paradox in which countries and regions which, with an abundance of natural resources, specifically non-renewable resources like minerals and fuels, tend to have less economic growth and worse development outcomes in countries with fewer natural resources. This is believed to happen for many reasons, including a decline in the competitiveness of other economic sectors, the volatility of revenues from the natural resource sector due to global commodity market swings, government mismanagement of resources or weak, ineffectual, unstable, or corrupt institutions. Africa has an abundant of natural resources from critical and desirable agricultural products such as gum arabic to strategic minerals such as cobalt, titanium, and coltan to energy resources such as petroleum and natural gas. However, under the so-called Africa resource curse, African citizens don't benefit from these resources to the extent that would be expected. Education, healthcare, and other services too often are not provided to citizens by their governments who profit from African resources, but rather are too often paid for by donors. Throughout history, African resources have led to negative outcomes for African people, more often than positive ones, such as slavery, colonization, predatory governments, and vicious rebel group activity. The ivory trade opened Africa to trans-Saharan trade to the Middle East and beyond, but it also opened Africa up to the earliest days of international slavery. Africa gold and other natural wealth made the continent and personalities in it famous and admired, but also led to even more expansive transatlantic slave trade. Ivory hunters wiped out the elephant population of various locations in Africa, and in recent years included the Lord's Resistance Army and its murderous reign of terror in the Great Lakes region. Minerals that power modern society also fund the chaos brought by militias, such as M23, and numerous other militias now terrorizing the eastern portion of the Democratic Republic of Congo. So-called blood diamonds fu earlier funded predatory rebels in Liberia and Sierra Leone. What should be a blessing, abundant natural resources, has all too often been a curse. It has been argued, for example, that one can correlate the rise and fall in the price of petroleum with the rise and fall of the implementation of human rights in major oil-producing countries. Protection of human rights throughout resource-cursed countries is dismal or completely lacking. Most resource-cursed countries are ruled by either authoritarian or other types of repressive regimes. These regimes are kept in power by an elite group, such as those compi comprised of high-ranking politicians and military leaders. As long as the exiting, existing government, I should say, keeps these few people happy, they can rule without fear of consequences. The system is set up so that those most in need of protection are left to fend for themselves. Ecuadoria Guinea is an example of how the resource curse, curse works. It is a small country with a population of slightly more than a half a million people, but a gross domestic product that has increased more than 125 times, not 125%, 125 times since oil production began in the mid-1990s. On paper, the wealth per capita in Equatorial Guinea is as high as almost any wealthy country in Africa, if not higher. Yet if you visit the country and move beyond the gleaming new hotels and resorts, you will find numerous people who are forced to survive on a dollar a day or less. Corruption in Equatorial Guinea is rampant. President Obiang owns two luxury homes in Washington, D.C. area, and his sons own two homes in numerous luxury cars in California. In fact, it is estimated that the president's son spent more on houses and cars alone in between 2004 and 2006 than the entire government spent on education in the year of 2005. Facts involving Equatorial Guinea's government's siphoning of natural resources profits were revealed in the 2004 U.S. Senate investigation of the Riggs Bank, which could, which was, could no longer continue operations due to financial improprieties partly involving questionable fund, funds from Ecuador and Guinea. The Obiang family dominates private business in the country, so commerce there benefits them first and foremost, 
rather than provide a means of economic opportunity more broadly. In order to counteract corrupt practices which, uh, from profits from natural resources and to ensure they're not diverted or otherwise abused, various international agreements, as we all know, have been created. The Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, or ITI, was created and announced at the 2002 World Summit for Sustainable Development in Johannesburg to provide a multi-stakeholder system that would require disclosure of profits from natural resource extraction. Thus far, 34 countries have produced EITI reports covering $1.02 billion in total government revenue. Four African countries have been officially suspended from the process for non-compliance. The Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Madagascar, and Sierra Leone. Similarly, the Kimberley process certification scheme established in 2009 by the UN General Assembly Resolution 5556 is designed to prevent conflict diamonds from entering the mainstream rough diamond markets. Global Witness, which presents testimony today, pulled out of the scheme two years ago, but there are those within the organization that reportedly still believe it provides at least a basis for addressing the problem of blood diamonds. Neither African governments nor the international community are helpless to effectively address the misuse of African natural resources. Working together, we can ensure that corruption is minimized, if not eliminated altogether. Protection of wildlife and other natural resources must be achieved. The day of corrupt governments shirking their responsibilities so that a select few can benefit from their country's blessings must be ended. Earlier today in Congress, we honored the life, legacy, and values of former South African President Nelson Mandela on his 95th birthday. During one of the, his visits to Congress, he told members that to deny a person's human rights is to deny their humanity. We must do all we can, not only to ensure that African natural resources benefit the people of African countries economically, but also to guarantee that human rights of, of African people are more fully respected by those who wield power through government authority or by the barrel of a gun. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for my colleagues for being here, and I would like to yield uh, to Karen Bass, the ranking member, for any opening comments you might have. Uh, as 